Welcome to Faith Reformed Baptist Church. Let's begin our time with prayer. Our God, we are thankful to be gathered together again as your people. We are thankful to uh, have you as our Lord, our Savior, uh, our Father, our friend. We uh, pray that you would own our worship, that you would hear our prayers, receive our thanks. We ask, too, that you would give us hearts, receptive hearts, to hear your word and to follow in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hymn 87. Our scripture reading this evening is from uh, Mark chapter 13. Uh, we'll read from uh, Mark 13, verse 3 uh, to verse 23. Mark chapter 13. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, let the reader understand then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down or enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. 
And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Be on your guard. I have told you all these things beforehand. Now we'll turn in our hymnals to 175. Before Nicholas comes, him 222. be attentive to hear the word of God. Good evening. Our text this evening is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. 
So do turn with me if you have your Bibles. I also like to say um, I, I chose this text before I realized that today was Father's Day. And um, we're looking this evening at Eli. Um, that wasn't intentional. And uh, happy Father's Day. It's also quite nice that art was, <laughs> took us to Hosea 11, kind of fit as well. Didn't it? Well, um, let's read together and then I will pray. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. And then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy ministered to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the young man Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. 
But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now, the young man Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus the Lord has said, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all the offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now, the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day, and I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread, and shall say, Please put me in one of the priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather and worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the reminder that we're on the, the cusp of eternity, of being with you in your presence for eternity, forever crying out, holy, 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 worshipping you, seeing you as you are, and being made completely like your son. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this is the great hope that we have. We thank you that you have given us your word, that you might preserve us, that you might give us life. Remember your saying, those who hear and obey my word, they are my mother and my brothers. Lord Jesus, we, we want to be yours more and more. We ask that you would give us your spirit, that we might hear your word and obey it that we might hear your word and apply it to our lives, that we might be found to be yours. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, in the year 355 AD, a man by the name of Victorinus became a Christian. And he was a well-known a public figure there in, in Rome. He, um, he was famous for, for translating um, Plato from Greek into Latin, and he was the teacher of many. He taught rhetoric. He taught um, the Roman uh, senators, and he even had a great honor bestowed on him in that he was given a statue right there in the center of the Roman Forum, the heart of the Roman Empire. But he became a Christian, and this was at a time when Christians were not allowed to hold the um, position of a teacher. 
he would speak with um, his, his Christian friend, um, let me try and say this right, Simplicianus. And, um, and Simplicianus would say, no, brother, you're, 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 not, you're not a Christian. I won't count you as a, as a Christian until you come out publicly and uh, declare your faith in Jesus, until you come to church with me. And um, Vic Victorinus would say, well, the four walls, did they make somebody a Christian? But the truth was that he was afraid. He was afraid to come out publicly as a Christian because it meant losing everything and being despised by the nobility and all his friends. As time went on, and in his old age, he became convicted that he did need to come out publicly in favor of Christ. And he told his friend, uh, Simplicianus, and they joyfully went to church together. There was the practice that um, you would stand up in front of the church and you would declare the creed. And when it was Victorinus's turn to do that, there was excited muttering among the congregation, people saying, Victorinus, it's Victorinus. This would be like one of the high profile figures of today who had spent all of their lives um, teaching worldly ideologies. And um, let me read the report. It's, it's, this story is recorded for us in um, Augustine's Confessions. And um, this is what he says about the church on this occasion. Spontaneous was their shout of delight as they saw him, and spontaneous their attentive silence to hear him. With magnificent confidence, he proclaimed the true faith. And all the people longed to clasp him tenderly to their hearts. And so they did by loving him and rejoicing with him. Uh, Victorinus never regretted that decision, even though it was very costly. There's, there is a, a correlation here between pride and our joy in the Lord, right? It's, it's, it's very logical, really. Our pride keeps us from worshiping the Lord, mm. keeps us from ascribing what we should to him. It's one of the struggles in our, in our Christian life, isn't it? We, we long to have more joy in the Lord. We long to have more joy when we think upon the gospel. We long to have more joy in the gospel than in the things of this world. And sometimes we struggle with that. Well, 1 Samuel chapter 2 has a lot to say about pride. And I want to suggest this evening that the purpose of our text is to turn our hearts away from pride that we might truly rejoice in his salvation. A couple of weeks ago, um, we were looking at 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we touched upon um, Mary's song. And um, you might remember, she, she saw her own experience as a picture of what would happen for Israel. Right, so she was taken from barrenness, and she was um, given... Um, honor and glory in the Lord. And, and she concludes, this must be the same for Israel. Although they're at this low point, God will send a Messiah and he will restore and save. Well, um, let's look a bit more closely um, this evening at, um, at that song. After her initial um, uh, thanksgiving, she focuses in on attributes of the Lord. So look with me at verse 2. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. She meditates on God's holiness. There is nothing in, in, in the whole of creation that, that can, can be compared to the Lord. There's no man-made God that even comes close. He is holy. He is above all things. He is beyond he is beyond us, and he's worthy, without sin, pure. There is no equal. 
She meditates also on his faithfulness. There is no rock like our God. When we hear that metaphor of a rock, we perhaps should think of like a, a, a craggy rock in which you could take shelter and, and, and refuge, even as David does um, when being pursued by Saul. Right? He's faithful, he's reliable, he's dependable. His salvation is such. In verse 3, she meditates on God as judge. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. You know, we can talk about the attributes of God and, and lightly pass over them, but when we stop, when we meditate on, on, on each attribute in turn, it's very humbling. When we just think about the fact that the Lord is a God of knowledge, he knows each and every one of us. He knows, he knows our every thought, even the ones that we soon quickly forget. He, he knows our every motivation, and he weighs them. When we stop and think that he does that for billions of people at the same moment in time, constantly, and we stop and we just think about God's attributes, what is our response? It can only be humility and awe and wonder. There is um, another attribute that she uh, makes reference to later in her song, verse um, 8, the, the end of verse 8. Um, For the, pyri- the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. It draws attention to the fact that God is creator. He created the whole universe. So she focuses on God's attributes to begin with, and they, these are causes for us to humble ourselves. And then she um, focuses on um, God's uh, salvation, how he saves. And um, there's a great reversal. We have, we have um, metaphor, metaphor after metaphor. I counted um, potentially um, seven different metaphors to describe God's salvation. And we can, we can meditate on these metaphors with, with reference to the gospel, with reference to what God, uh, uh, God has done for us in Jesus. The first metaphor there in, in verse 4, the bows of the mighty are broken, the feeble bind on strength. They, they clothe themselves with strength. That's what we have in the gospel, don't we? We have God's spirit. We have, we have the armor of God. We can stand against even the devil in his strength. The, the second metaphor, those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. Of course, Jesus is the bread of life. He completely satisfies us. We, before we were Christians, we were completely hungry. We, we were starving, and yet he satisfies us completely. He goes on to talk about barrenness. Uh, sorry, she, she goes on to talk about barrenness and having many children. In Christ, we are given family, aren't we? There, there are many joys, great reversals from what we had before Christ to what we have now, what she experiences before putting her hope in uh, his salvation and, and what she has now at this moment. We have the metaphor of life to death, verse 6. The Lord kills and he brings to life. He raises us up from Sheol. We were dead in our sins. We had nothing and yet we were given life. Such is the salvation we've received. We have the metaphor of poverty. The Lord makes poor and he makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. Paul writes that... Um, Christ, though he was rich, he became poor, so that through his poverty we might also become rich. We've been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing, and, and it's, it's a wonderful metaphor of what God has done for us. All of a sudden, we, we, we're no longer poor, but we have riches. 
He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to sit them with princes. We're giving honor, even a seat of honor. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. When we meditate on, on, on what God has done for us in the gospel, it, it, is, it is beyond really what we can, we can really comprehend and grasp the great gift that he has freely given us. And the last metaphor there that uh, we, could, we could point to is verse 9. He guards the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked are cut off in darkness. He watches over us. He lights our way. He protects us. Well, if looking at the attributes of God causes us to bow in humility... Thinking about God's salvation should bring us joy. And this is, of course, a song of thanksgiving. Saying that, there is one exhortation, and you probably saw it there in verse 3. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. She exhorts us to lay aside our pride. And... um, we can see then the purpose of, of, of this text, which is to turn our hearts away from pride, that we might truly rejoice in his salvation. One of the really exciting things about um, Hannah's uh, song is that it points us forward to the rest of um, the book of Samuel. It, it stands as one bookend. So the books of Samuel, you have... Um, you have Hannah's song in, here in chapter 2, and then at the end you have David's song in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22. And I want us to uh, briefly turn there. We're not going to spend too long here, but just I want us to observe um, a few things. There are clear echoes between the two songs. So 2 Samuel chapter 22. Let me just read a, a few of the verses. In, in, to begin with verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. Verse 17, he sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he rescued me from my strong enemy. Verse 26, With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. With the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. You save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. Verse 32. Who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. And then at the end, verse um, 47, the Lord lives, blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance. Verse 50, for this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. And there's clear echoes between the two songs. I'm sure you picked up on, uh, on, on many of them. The metaphor of the rock, the metaphor of the horn being exalted, um, the picture of, um, of, of the haughty being humbled and those who are lowly on the point of death being uh, raised up, God's faithfulness to his king. And so these are, these are themes that are central to the book of, of um, Samuel. And they pervade through all of the stories. We think of, um, of Eli. We think of um, the calling and the rejection of Saul. Or you might think of Daniel, uh, sorry, David and, and Goliath. All of these stories and, and, and many more show these themes, display these themes for us. Hannah's song then points forward as well. So it... it it helps us to unpack chapter 1 
and, and, and the significance of, of those events, but it also helps us to understand what is going on here with Eli. In fact, you cannot really understand this uh, text without pointing back to, um, uh, to Hannah's song. Verses 12 um, to 36, then, are structured around these two contrasts. The first contrast we have is between Eli's sons and Samuel. So read with me in verse um, 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest servant would come with the meat uh, while the meat was boiling, with a three-pronged free fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or the kettle or the cauldron or the pot. And all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. That is, um, if it wasn't true, it would almost be comical. This picture of the priest just like sticking the, the fork in and how much did we get out? But that is so against what the Lord had decreed for them. No, look, this, this part of the animal is for the priest. This part, the fat, belongs to God, and this is for the rest of them. It's not about displaying um, greed and how much can, can you get. But there's more. Verse 15, Moreover, before the fat was burned, before the, what belongs to the, the Lord is taken away, the priest servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Imagine threatening violence. These are, these are God's priests. These are the people who are meant to be leading the people in worship, and they're threatening them with violence. And, and the, the great irony, of course, is that it's the people who are pointing them to the scripture. It's the people who are telling them how they should be doing it, how they should be honoring God. The summary verse in verse 17 then tells us what the Lord thinks of it. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. It strikes me then that Hannah, Hannah, when she came and dedicated Samuel, she said those words in verse 3, perhaps not directly to Eli and his sons, but it was God's word to them. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. The, the sons of Eli are contrasted clearly with Samuel. Verse 18, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. What, um, what merits could we say about Samuel? Well, not very much, really, except that he's clearly not doing what Eli's sons were doing. That's a, a huge plus. But he's presented to us as a boy who wears just a linen ephod, right? Humble. Uh, an ephod was something worn by the, the priests. Uh, only the Levites could, um, could wear. And, of course, in the coming chapters, if you know the story, um, Eli's sons pass away, and it is Samuel who, who, who um, is raised up to lead the people and to lead them also in their sacrifices and their religious servants. He is the one that, the God, that God will use, one of humility. And we're, we're meant to, to read about Eli's sons, and we're meant to be shocked. We're meant to be scared, even, that we should display any such pride in our lives. What were they doing in front of the tent of meeting, right there in the presence of the Lord, sinning as if God doesn't see? Sometimes we can sin intentionally. 
And it is as if we are saying to God, you don't see. Displays great pride. While the first contrast between Eli's sons and Samuel and, and the, the second contrast between Hannah and Eli. Very interesting when you think about this, uh, verses 18 to 21. Why, why would the narrator put them here in the middle of talking about Eli's sons and Eli? You kind of think, wouldn't it have been better if you had placed it immediately after Hannah's song? Right? It would have made a fitting conclusion to the story of Hannah and Elkanah, um, right? especially that they're blessed and they're given more sons and, and, and daughters. Well, I've, I've already intimated the reason that the narrator puts these verses here so as to contrast Eli and his sons with Hannah and Samuel. Hannah, um, we, we had this already in chapter 1, is compared with Eli in her devotion, compared to his spiritual blindness. But now we, we have her compared in her family relationships. And you can see in the way that she um, is a mother to Samuel, how that flows out of her devotion to the Lord. Right? She would go up yearly and sacrifice, and, and at the same time, she would make for him a robe. But that is not true for Eli. He is not seeking to honor God and glorify God in his parenting. And, and we'll see that. But see, H Hannah seeks to glorify God and receives a blessing. Eli does not glorify God and receives um, judgment. I want to uh, make a, a comment here about, um, about parenting and, and, and this passage, because I think it's often misunderstood what's going on. And, and people can see this and say, well, Hannah was godly, and so she had godly children, and um, Eli's um, sons were wicked, so what does that say about Eli? But if we really pay attention to the text, that is not what Scripture teaches. It's not saying that godly parents will have um, god honoring um, children. Uh, look, first of all, with me at verse um, 26, commenting about Samuel. The young man Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And that also echoes verse 21. The, the young man Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Why did he grow? Or was it because Hannah was such a great parent? No, it's because the Lord was with him. He was in the presence of the Lord. And that contrasts with verse 25, uh, the, the, the latter part. They would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. So the reason why um, they fall short isn't because of Eli's parenting. It's because of the Lord. That was his will. There is, there is a pride in the way we can think as parents in thinking that the salvation of our children is our responsibility. That's not our responsibility. It's God's. We are to honor God and worship him in the way we parent. We are to honor him and glorify him in seeking to raise children in the fear of the Lord. And we are to honor and glorify him in trusting and praying for children. Well, um, If you needed any more proof of that point, then um, let me also um, tell you about um, Samuel himself, because Samuel was held as a godly man. Very little negative is said about Samuel, and yet um, in chapter 8 we read about his children, um, Joel and Abijah. In verse 3 of chapter 8, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took, pri and they took bribes and they perverted justice. Um, somewhat connected with this, I think there's a misunderstanding in, in this passage 
and we need to clarify. God is not judging Eli for the sins of his children. God judges Eli because of his own sins. And um, we can see that very clearly. Um, what are his sins? Let's read from verse 22. And now, Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it's not a good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. Now, it says in his old age, or sorry, very old age. And so it leads us to wonder, what was he doing exactly? Like, all these years, before his very old age, was he not correcting? Was he not rebuking? These things that we read about before, and added to that, this sin of uh, sexual immorality, right, right there in front of the tent of meeting. We might wonder, why, why now? Why in his old age? Is, it, is his problem with the sin, or is it the shame that is brought on the family as a result of the sin? I think there is perhaps a mixed motive, because you, you hear how it um, makes emphasis on the fact that this is told by all the people, and this report is being spread abroad among all the people of the Lord. So perhaps his concern is more about his own honor. But you would say to me, but Nicholas, he does, he does rebuke his sons. That's got to count for something, right? Well, he does. But he needs to do more than rebuke in this situation. And especially when they continue in their sin, they need to be removed from serving in this way. And that is something he neglects to do. Let's look briefly at his rebuke in um, verse 25. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? This is um, perhaps at first glance difficult because all sin is against the Lord. So what's he saying? I think, I think there is truth in what Eli says here. Um, John, John, in 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 uh, the first epistle of John, he he says there is a sin that leads to death, right? So, if you deny Christ as the Messiah, you accuse God, and and call him a liar. What then is your what then is your hope? And it's 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 a similar thing going on here. You know, there, there's there's sin. And then there's sinning as they are doing right in front of God, denying the fact that he is there, that he judges, that he sees. Right? So, so what hope is left for them? It's very interesting to me, actually, that, that God uses Eli. He uses him to bless um, Hannah and Elkanah, and um, he uses him here to speak um, a degree of truth. And yet, the fact that God uses him does not mean that he, that, that, that kind of justifies him, because it doesn't. He is still guilty and worthy of, of, of judgment. And it's the same. We see, we see sometimes, or we hear about ministers of the Lord who, who preach for years, and then they turn out to be in, um, in great sin, and yet God has used such men to bring about his purposes. And we, we just have to marvel in those situations at God's um, sovereignty. Well, um, let's consider the case further again uh, 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 concerning Eli. Yes, he's, he falls short, but it's not just that. The issue is he doesn't repent. We all fall short, right? But the issue is he doesn't repent. He, he's visited here by a man of the Lord, 
but there's no repentance in response. And, and in the next chapter also, Samuel hears from the Lord and he gives the message to, to Eli. But again, he refuses to repent. Um, let's see if I can find it there in chapter 3. Um, verse 17, Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me from all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him, and he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. The man of God comes to Eli, and he has a message from the Lord. This is at a time when the word of the Lord was rare. Yet God sends... Um, sends a man to him with a message. Verses 27 to 28 looks back at God's goodness and his faithfulness um, to both Eli and to his, um, to his fathers. Right? He's completely innocent. He's, he, he's completely blameless. He has only, he's only been faithful and good from the time of um, their slavery in Egypt all the way to the present. And then in verse 29, the accusation. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people, Israel? So there, there are two things there. You'll notice, he's, notice again, he's not being punished because of his son's sins. He's being punished and judged according to his own sins. And we read earlier about what they were doing with these offerings. They were taking um, more than they should, and they were taking the fat. And it's clear that he was very much involved in that as well. He did not put a stop to it. He did not say anything against it. He is completely um, complicit in it. There's maybe also a reference and to this fact in, in, um, in chapter 4, um, verse 18. The, as soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backwards from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy. And it's quite likely that the text mentions that he was heavy, um, in relation to this sin. And the second, the, 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 the second accusation that is leveled against Eli is that he honors his sons more than the Lord. So he despises the Lord's offerings, he despises the Lord, and yet he, he honors his sons more than the Lord. There's a principle laid out for how God judges in verse 30. Far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. That is the, that's the basis on which God judges. Right? So if we seek to honor God, if we humble ourselves before him, then he will honor us. That is an incredible promise. But the, the reverse is also um, true, and it is very scary, that when we despise the Lord, when we don't honor him in our lives, we will be lightly esteemed and um, judged. Well, um, there are a few specifics in verses 31 to 36 about this judgment that is, um, that is going to come on Eli and his household. We're going to look at this just um, um, briefly. Um, I've noticed three specific things that are, are said. First of all, um, no old person will, um, will be in his house. Verses um, 31 to 32, it says it more than once. There shall not be an old man in your house forever. In other words, there won't be a person in a position of influence. There won't be somebody with um, enough age and authority to take a position of influence within the priesthood. Um, secondly, that those who remain will be grieved. 
We see that in verse 33. He'll weep his eyes out to grieve his heart. And um, then we also see it in verse 36. Everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread. I can't read those words and not think of Hannah's song, right? That those, um, those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. The, the judgment on Eli's house being reflected also in, in Hannah's song. And then the third um, detail that is spoken to Eli is this. Uh, verse 34. This shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and it shall be a sign upon you, uh, a sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And um, you can read about that in just a couple of chapters' time. It is a sign to Eli. Well, he doesn't live much longer then Hophni and Phinehas, as it turns out, it's a sign of something that's going to happen in the future. So we read, we read these opening chapters, and there's a sense in which Samuel um, takes over from um, the role of um, Hophni and, and Phinehas and, um, and also Eli. Um, but there's a greater sense in which this points forward to a time um, much beyond um, Samuel, and we can read about this in First Kings chapter two. Um, Solomon is um, is getting rid of Abiathar the priest, and um, he is replacing him. Verse twenty seven. So Solomon expelled Abiathar from being priest of the Lord, thus fulfilling the word of the Lord that he had spoken concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. And then if you look at verse 45 of that chapter, you see that he puts Zadok, um, the priest. Oh, sorry, 35, the verse 35. Zadok, the priest, in place of Abiathar. And this is really fascinating to me because... Um, God is faithful both to his word of judgment on Eli, but he's also faithful to his word of promise to um, Aaron's son, Eliezer, because God made a covenant with um, the Levites. And he said it would be a perpetual um, covenant. It also speaks to me of um, the relationship between Christ and the Levitical priesthood. Because judgment comes on the Levitical priesthood, and yet all of the promises are continued forward in Christ. Right? It's not that he, he does away with that plan of the, the, the Levites and all his promises and forgets them because they were unfaithful. It's that he also fulfills his promises in Christ. Um, and that's a, a topic that requires more time. But we are to look at the example of Eli and Eli's sons, and we are um, to be scared. Mm. We're to think, L Lord, I hope, Lord, keep me from any such pride, especially, especially that I would be slow to come to you and ask for mercy and forgiveness. Um, Jesus tells this, this um, sorry, uh, Luke tells the story there in um, chapter 18 of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The tax collector, he prays, I thank you, I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like that tax collector. But how does the tax collector pray? He stands far off, beats his breast, and he doesn't lift up his eyes. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus concludes and he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I want us to close by thinking a little bit about application. We've, um, we've been thinking all this time about the purpose of this passage as... Um, to turn our hearts 
away from pride, that we might rejoice, truly rejoice in his salvation. How? How can we turn our hearts away from pride? Pride almost infiltrates every crevice of our hearts and our, our thoughts. It's constantly there. We're constantly thinking about ourselves. It strikes me that for the world, humility is something of an impossibility. Well, you can try and be humble, right? You can try and uh, do that, but what is your motivation? Oh, it's so that other people would think better of you. So it's not really possible. It's a paradox. You can't really attain humility. But for the Christian, humility is, is a compulsion. When we come before the living God, when we think about who he is, you cannot help but humble yourself before him. For the world, well, it's, it's something you can't attain to, but your, your, your best hope is to try not to think about yourself, to try and be as completely passive and, and, um, and hope that you end up being um, somewhat humble. But for the Christian, this is something that we actively do. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it's, it tells us to clothe ourselves with humility. Right? We, we cannot be humble before others if we are not humble before God. So we come before him, we think about who he is, and we are humbled. Christians, we need to daily experience Jesus. We need to daily gaze upon him and who he is, humble ourselves. And um, I want to encourage you, if, if, if that is not your practice... It needs to be, because if we don't do this, and if we're not filled daily with joy when we think about the gospel, then we, we, we end up living this Christian life, which is just kind of assenting to certain truths and doctrines, but not really experiencing the joy that comes through walking with Christ daily. You might say to me, I, I try. I try and have devotions. I try and do quiet times. All I end up doing is, is just kind of thinking thoughts, and maybe I try and read the Bible, but I don't, I don't end up feeling closer, or I don't ex experience that joy. Um, well, I think the, the Song of Hannah is really helpful, and it is, it's a practical guide for us here. Right? First of all, we can start by thinking about the attributes of God. This is um, advice that I was once given, and I, I, I see it here as well. To just take an attribute of God each day, it might be um, holiness, and, and think of some related text and meditate on them, and think upon, say, the holiness of God. And then after that, also to think upon his salvation and the gospel. There are many, many images, many uh, pictures that we have for what Jesus has done for us. One day we might be uh, meditating on, on Jesus saying to the Samaritan woman, um, drink of, of my water. The, the water I give, you, you're drinking, you'll never be thirsty again. And you can meditate on that and meditate on how God completely satisfies. And the next day you might be thinking about baptism and how we were dead in our sins. And yet he has given us life every day, thinking on the gospel from a different angle and rejoicing, coming to the point of rejoicing in the gospel daily. Preach to yourself until you are filled with the joy of the gospel. Um, second, and, and, and briefly, I wanted to say, there might be some uh, listening who, um, who are particularly uh, convicted when they look at the um, sins of Eli and Eli's sons. There might be um, intentional, explicit sin in your life that is unresolved. We need to look at the example of Eli and flee. We need to come to God. 
we need to confess our sins. We need to confess our sins to one another and be accountable in some situations. That is also uh, God glorifying. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, may the Lord grow us in humility and in joy. And uh, let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we, we long to truly rejoice in you. Many of us, we, we, we know that joy of walking and being so close and intimate with you. And yet there are times when we long for more and we feel as though we're not experiencing your joy as we should. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would draw us to yourself, that you would humble us, that we would be able to gaze upon you daily and enjoy your salvation. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would grow us as your people, that we would be an encouragement to one another to pursue you with everything, laying everything aside for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.